and recording. Hi, Maddie. Hello. Hi. Uh, so we're doing an interview on you and your art today, and I just wanted to um, ask you some questions. Great. Thank you. Okay, cool. So uh, first, where are you from? I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. I grew up in Tempe and South Scottsdale. Okay. Um, yeah, I, all my life I went to school in South Scottsdale, um, Coronado High School. And I did graduate with a scholarship to, that I then took to um, the Scottsdale Community College and started working at the Scottsdale Center for the Arts. I was always involved in the arts, gravitated to it very naturally as um, was encouraged by my family to do so. Uh, my parents were involved in the first Middle Avenue Arts Fair. And yeah, it just came real natural. I felt comfortable being within the arts community. And while I was in college and working at the Scottsdale Center for the Arts, they sponsored a performance troupe to come through called Circus Flora. They were a not-for-profit circus that was for the preservation of circus arts. They really tapped into early American circus that came over from Europe with the single ring, big top. Uh, there was a movement in the 80s that started. There was four or five circuses that were involved in this movement. That was Circus Flora, Big Apple Circus, the Pickled Family Circus, and uh, Circus Olay. Circus Soleil had huge sponsors. They had AT&T and they were, you know, French Canadian and they took off really, really well, and they set out to change the face of circus. Um, the circus that I was with, part of that same movement to recreate the single ring circus, um, but they were really driving the traditional old world circus, honoring the families that came from Europe. Um, and I, I had the privilege of working with a lot of those families, and it really gave me a strong sense of heart and soul and lets you see sort of what the human potential is. It was amazing. It was amazing to work with them and see what humans are capable of. They make these superhuman feats look so easy. Um, so why did you start painting? I, I was always painting, you know, drawing, always, always, since as long as I can remember, since I was very, very young, um, I did have the opportunity to dabble with like oil paints when I was around nine years old with my great grandmother. Um, she was always painting and yeah, she, she would delve into it a lot. Um, I guess I always felt I would paint. I, I guess I didn't for a while though. Um, I was studying sculpture for a bit at the Scottsdale Community College. And then when I was at the circus, it, it was really gave me a chance to blend all of my interests. Um, my focus in college was, you know, performing arts as well as visual arts. And under the big top, you know, I could embrace both of, the, both of those things simultaneously. I could perform in the, in the ring with the, as an actress. And then I was also a prop, and scenic designer. So I was always painting, sculpting, being creative. Um, and when I stopped touring with them, I started getting involved in the downtown Phoenix arts community. Um, there were musicians I met that were absolutely wonderful. And it, it um, I think it was called Soul Tracks. There was a, it was a music, musical, hmm, what do you call it? Uh, it was a creative project at the Emerald Lounge. And I remember seeing this particular group and it just set my mind in, back, back into the circus where I could see performers performing to their music. And at that point I got together with some of the people I knew downtown and put some shows together and was doing that for some art openings. And they encouraged me to get back into my painting. And that's when, when that happened. So my first show I sold out opening night I 
it and maybe I should keep doing it. <laughs> Tell me about this painting here. That painting is inspired by Circus Flora very much. Um, our ringmaster would always have very, very unique and interesting costumes. And the other influences of this piece is the big top tent that you see above the right shoulder of that character. Um, it was a French, I believe it's French made tent um, that we had brought over. And it always reminded me of like Mount Fuji. You can see it sort of looks like a snow capped peak at the top. Um, I think I portrayed that in the painting. Yeah, you can see it there. And then in the 13 years that I toured with Circus Flora, it was a little bit strange because we would encounter a lot of storms. Like in Norfolk, Virginia, we had a hurricane that hit and it took down the front entrance, the entry tent. Um, it broke a lot of the side poles. And in St. Louis, where we had a board of directors there, um, so we sort of had a home base and then oh, summer quarters there. A lot of um, tornadoes were really close to us. So I've been having several years, um, and it was it was an amazing challenge to save the tent. So you see this sort of wave in the background of this painting. Um, sort of the essence of my touring with them. This sort of mysterious character in the front and the, yeah. What about these? Oh, the juggler. Yeah, the character, the large character is um, a clown, sort of old world clown, clown if you will. And then um, I kind of have a sense that a lot of, well, the romances of the circus and the drama of it all. And this one is called The Juggler because he's juggling these ladies. <laughs> and this one? This one um, I call Big and Little. It's, it's um, the name actually is inspired by an act that we had at the circus with a Clydesdale and a miniature horse. Um, but I loved the, the look and feel of these characters together, you know, the, the big man and the little man. I'm going to ask you about all of them. <laughs> this is the Dream Maestro, originally called the Dream Maestro. He, he's a character that I saw in a dream. I woke, I woke up from a dream and it, it was this really interesting character. And uh, I was talking with our general manager on, on the lot of a show, you know, we were on site and she had a similar dream. I was telling her about it and she said she dreamt about the same character. And I thought, wow, well, it's, really, it's really amazing. And um, they were actually working on a show. Her and um, um, Giovanni Zope were, were exploring a show where they would have this sort of character as ringmaster and they approached um what is that director's name from baltimore um john waters is that a director i think that was him they approached him to see if he would play this character because he really fit the bill you know the funny little mustache and the dark hair and just the mysterious strange character but anyway i never saw it materialize so I started painting him and there he is. And then years later, um, he was an inspiration for the escape room that I opened recently. Um, so I just opened an art gallery um, that has an escape room attached to it. And he is the inspiration. That is a commission I did for, um, uh, this gentleman's dog that passed and we actually added some of her ashes into the painting so her nose and her pupils and the pads of her feet is an oil this was um 
a commission for uh, an esthetician's office. So it's a logo that she had and I, I've created it on canvas with plaster. So it would be a real texture piece. I like this logo for you. It's a detail with the logo. Yeah, I really like the design. Do you, somebody. You can, might want to think about doing something like that for your logo. Nice. Okay. That piece was done for the right, the David Wright House in Phoenix. Um, it's, uh, it's a building that Frank Lloyd Wright designed. And I guess one of his ancestors has it now. I think that's the way that goes. But they had a tradition at Taliesin, Taliesin West, the school here in Arizona, Frank Lloyd Wright School, to do all the, all the students who were studying there would do these eggs for their Easter dinner. And David Wright House decided they wanted to bring that back to life. So they, through, I think it was Artlink, approached me about participating. And they gave us these ostrich eggs and then suggested we do some art on them. And it, it seemed like a globe to me. So uh, there it is. I wound up etching into the surface of the ostrich egg because it was, you know, such a slick surface. It was hard to get. And I use the pigment that I use so often in my paintings. So you have like a circus, uh, you know, look to your paintings. What, tell me more about that. There, you can see why <laughs> in this photo. This is my dear friend, Tosca Zope. She's, um, I don't know, fifth generation circus from Italy and they've been touring around the US, um, her and her brother. But she does these schools in Northern Arizona. Well, it's more central, it's by Cottonwood. It's a ranch there. Um, so I went- you, on the horses? Yeah. That's so cool. That was in this last spring, I think is when that was. Well, that's amazing. That's really fun. So you are, in the circus first or painter first? I guess I was in the circus first, technically. I mean, I was always involved in the arts. There's, there was never a time that I wasn't involved in the arts, but I didn't pin myself down as a painter until after the circus. What is this? Ah, <laughs> uh, this is an antique rocking chair that I, I'm kind of a collector, I love antiques, and I found myself with too many of them. So I was attempting to sell them, and this was a strange piece. So I decided to dress it up with, you know, a koi pond. <laughs> Why not? It's cool. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah, and that went along with it. And that was Tosca Zope, again, she was, she does the classes up in around Cottonwood at a Equestrian Hope, I think is the name of the ranch. And they did a, a show under the stars, a dinner theater, and invited me to come and show my work there. So that was, when was that? I guess that was this last spring. Same. Are you using the sepia color? Tell me about that. Um, you know, I started painting with watercolor, a single tone of watercolor, burnt umber or sepia, one of those. And um, the, I guess my inspiration for that is sort of comes from old world, like circus photos, like photography, sepia tone photography that has that tinge of brown to it. Right. And also, you know, old drawings of the masters, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, sort of the mechanical drawings that you see in that brown tone. Um, so that's what I was painting in. And when I moved to Spain, I was showing at a street fair, like they had some medieval markets and that I participated in and I would show my work. And this gentleman who was a Bulgarian art professor in Valencia, and he approached me and said that, it looked like I was painting with this ancient pigment. 
but I wasn't, and he introduced it to me. So that's when I started using walnut. Walnut. So tell me yeah. more about that. Yeah, it's pretty lovely. It's a water-based um, pigment. You can find it here in liquid form. I've been able to find it, but I've only found the powder in Spain. So yeah, it goes a really long ways. Luckily, last time I was there, I bought a big bag. It's a powder? It is, it is. Cool. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah, it works. I think they call it ink traditionally, like in a lot oh, of- is it Because that it's not toxic? It's not toxic, correct? Right? Water-based and yeah, it was used as ink. I mean, a lot of sketches, mechanical drawings, ancient stuff. Um, so, you know, there's something about this look that I really love. And uh, what, what is it that you want to do with your work? Do you know yet? Well, I would love to keep producing my work. Uh, I need to have, I need to get it out there to the public more because there's, I don't have room to just keep storing paintings. <laughs> I need a reason to keep creating them, right? <laughs> If there's a market, if people want my work, I'm, you know, truly honored and uh, would love to get it out there. Um, well, there is a market, you know, there's, I think art.com is like a hundred million dollars a year market. Um, and I know that the art industry in general, uh, people want art as much as they want their houses and their cars and their million dollar, you know, uh, mansions, they want art on their walls. So there is definitely a market. Um, I like your work in the sense that like, it brings, it's like joy to me, mm. you know, it has a sense of joy and fun and like allure and it's also a little comical, but at the same time, it has this old world kind of feel to it, you know, like because of the nut, um, what, what was it called? The walnut pigment? The walnut pigment, pigment. I think that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Ah, yeah, thanks. It's really cool, and it is a marketable, yeah, it's, it is a marketable thing. Um, not just because it's a cool brown kind of vintage look, but, um, because you're using natural pigments, you know. Um, so tell me what you've done so far to market your work. Um, oh. I guess it's been a little bit since I've marketed my work. I've been really focused on the escape gallery that really put a lot of my my experience to work, you know, really with my... Well, tell us about the escape gallery. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's based on this character that I painted, the Dream Maestro, a mysterious ringmaster character. And um, I've called it Dr. Valentini's escape room. And you're invited into the winter quarters of showman and alchemist, Dr. Valentini. Uh, he's been kidnapped by an evil consortium and they are on their way to the winter quarters to try to find his formula for gold and we are asking for your help to find that before they get here there we we guess they'll be here in about an hour so you're invited into the rehearsal room at dr valentini's winter quarters and from there, you'll have to find his secret laboratory. We have not been able to do so. We hope that you can find a secret laboratory and the coveted formula for gold. And this is something where you put the people inside of a room and let them find them their way out, right, with the clues. Exactly. It's called a, a escape room. Yes. Yeah, it's an escape room. And then in the, in the foyer and the reception area is an art gallery. So I'll be showing my work here, as well as um, inviting other artists to have shows. And yeah, back to your question, where have I marketed my work so far? Um, you know, at the, my friend's circus that comes every year, the Zope Circus at the Chandler Center for the Arts. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I would take my Airstream there, which I turned into an art gallery. Uh, and at the Grand Avenue Arts Fair, it was the last time I had my Airstream out. Um, so I guess I don't really market my work much. Where's that picture? Um, it's here, right? Uh, there's one at the Zope Circus. That's a nice one. That's my Airstream gallery sitting in front of their big top. Oh, well, that's so cool. Isn't that fun? There's an even better photo somewhere. Don't know if I could look on another. Oh, that was another thing I did that's interesting. I just saw a photo that you scrolled through the, the intaglio etchings I did in- This one? Yeah. Where was it? No, that was some live paintings I did. Um, I was hired to do a live painting on my trapeze rig. I wound up doing a little bit of aerial performance with the circus before I left and then a lot in downtown Phoenix. Um, and then more recently I started doing live paintings on the trapeze. This was a shot from that show. It looks like an ice sculpture or something. Is it glass? It's ice. What it's nothing it? that I did though. It what was is just it? the event. It was, um, I think it was Yelp. It was Yelp's Christmas party. Yeah. Um, what is the medium? It's ice. It is ice. Yeah. It's a nice sculpture. It's cool. Isn't that wonderful? Awesome. Lovely. Um, so, you know, as an artist, you know, from, you know, the life of an artist is they're, they're doing art. Uh, some of them are doing art like full time and that's all they do. And then there's people that have different um, interests, right? And so they're dabbling, right? And what I'm doing with my mentorship and then interviews and stuff is talking about the art and kind of zeroing in on the market, like if it, how to market your work and if it's marketable and if, um, and when you want to go to that next level, how to do it, right? And um, I love this painting. That was a commission. When I was living in Spain, I met this gentleman, um, Danny Cesario. And he was, um, he, he's French, he grew up in circus, and he was married to Yasmin Smart in England for a while. And they did this act, it's amazing, yeah. So that's a, that's a, just a piece of a bigger painting. Yeah, I love it. You know, the, the first thing that comes to my mind when I uh, look at your work is I want to see it on a big scale. Mm. You know, I see it like, 60 by 70 canvas. Have you ever done anything that big? The biggest I think I've done would be like three by five, three feet by five feet. Yeah, so a 60 inch by 70 inch canvas. Uh, Love to. Yeah, I, that's where I see your, the, the work like coming alive. Mm. And um, I know for galleries there's you know how many like you know how many houses that are that have these huge walls and people are looking for something that's going to fit their huge wall right they don't i mean they might need a nice bedroom piece but a lot of times they are looking for like oversized paintings so that's where i see your work i see it center stage you know um, love that. Yeah, these are great. It's like people love the circus. People love joy. They want happiness and they want mystique, you know, uh, so that you can play around with the size. And I think the size is like a little bit audacious, you know, like how dare you make something so huge. Right, right. <laughs> but so is the circus. The circus is like huge, right? Right. It's a huge experience. It's like a mind altering, you know, experience. So I think like, how do you make the circus world 
come alive in a painting. And I, I would say it's with, um, partially with size. This is part of a storyboard for the escape gallery, for the escape room, Dr. Valentini's escape. There was, you know, there are kind of quicker sketches almost. I love the alligator hanging. Ah, yeah, I found those in a, like paintings and etchings of ancient alchemists. See, uh, you know, I, for me, just the alligator hanging would be a great painting. Yeah. See? Love it. Do you see it? A fun. Yeah, so you take elements and who doesn't want an alligator hanging in their living room? Like, <laughs> it's like who people would love it, you know, and it's very like mysterious and a little bit devious and a little circus and a little, uh, you know, old school with the walnut um, sepia. And I think you have something really cool that you could expand on um, as an artist you know like one of the things that I do uh, is I I do a sketch a master sketch every morning so you know you get it wake up have a cup of coffee or a tea and that came from my grandmother who was a painter and she said just don't, you know don't focus on making money just focus on being the very best that you can be. Yeah. That's great advice, right? Yeah. Beautiful. So I was like, okay, grandma, if you say so, right? <laughs> and it's true, it's true. Whenever I'm like a little bit late, you know, not doing uh, as well as I, as I would like financially, um, I always go back to the basics. And so, what ends up happening is uh, when you do it every day, you take that into your paintings, right? So you would, you would focus on, you can still keep that stylized look, which I think is so cool, to, you know, but you can also uh, do a sketch of a tree, you know, do a sketch of a, of a tent, do a sketch of a car, right? Um, and then, as you go along, you incorporate, uh, your, your knowledge would get incorporated into the painting because we never forget. Muscle right? memory, right? Yeah, muscle memory. It's like yeah. performers, aerialists, you have the muscle memory of your routine. Yeah. You practice every day. Yeah, and it, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be like 10 minutes, it can be like 20 minutes, whatever you want, right? Or it can be an hour. Um, but it's something where you just learn how to do it. Tell me about this. Uh, that was a commission. Um, Tosca Zope, who has been such a great support of my work. I've shown, you know, my art at their circus many, many times. And she commissioned me to do this for Aurelia, her cousin, Aurelia Wallenda Zope. She's one of the Wallendas, uh, which are a big famous family. Um, and we thought I was gonna do a circus painting for her, but she really wanted something that wasn't circus. She wanted something of her wedding. So this is her beautiful wedding gown that I believe belonged to her mother. And yeah. And that was the sketch, that was the first time I did an aerial painting. I went up in the big top and I hung in a swing and I did live paintings during their performances. So a two hour show, I, would, I did the uh, Tosca doing this, what's called the Spanish web and her husband down below, who's the ringmaster. So that was, you know, a two hour painting. Shy the, the break that we have, you know, I stop at intermission, I'll come down out of the ceiling and <laughs> Take a break and get back up there. Have you ever thought of doing, um, you know, I like, if, you know, if you go ahead and do the bigger ones, one of the things that I found out that people really like is texture. Mm. And 
playing around with background textures, notes, letters, you know, old school vintage kind of things. Um, maybe it'd be something to play around with where you throw in like old school vintage surface stuff. Yeah. You know, and then on top of it and then draw on top of it. Okay. Um, it's just an idea. I mean, you have all of these things going on anyways. That's a tattoo I did for a friend. <laughs> yeah, this is cool. But it all has like the Maddie Bain, like this right here. I just would love to see that huge. And, uh, you know, it has this really cool stylized look to it with the walnut. You know, it's just, it's really appealing. I think it's very soothing. So it has a little bit of a decor feel, and um, but yet it's uh, it's uh, it's still like yours, you know. It, I mean, you definitely have a style, which is very brandable. Like you, you can brand yourself. Hmm. Um, you know if. As far as like doing just a quick, you know, mentorship, right? Where what I would do if I was in your situation, that's what I would do. I would go large and uh, then I would start doing some trade shows. And there's so many trade shows out there. I mean, there's like stuff in every city, you know, from like, like a little tent craft since uh, to like a really big deal one, you know. Some of the trade shows that I've done have been, you know, like $20,000 a booth. Um, wow. And what, you know, like at the height of like New York, I had 300 galleries and I would sell out 100 paintings at the show. I mean, wow. so I would just come home with like $250,000 pocket. Wow. And, and orders. <laughs> so I was like, I can't do it. So I thought I was going to, I was like, I need to get it like a, like a um, old school, like market gallery, like Andy Warhol did. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I just saw his museum in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And he was, I've, I've read a lot of autobiographies on artists and he was phenomenal, but he said the ultimate art is, is to make money. <laughs> I mean, he was a capitalist for sure, but, <laughs> but I, I like the way he thought about it. He's just like, that's the ultimate art, you know. Nonsense. I am just chuck, chuck, <laughs> And uh, so, anyways, so that's one of the things that I would do. I would, I would over, I would keep everything that you have, papers, posters, limited editions, and small paintings, and then I would oversize everything, and then you know, save your pennies, put, get a booth, you know, like there's some of the booths now are like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. So you could get like a booth at a nice trade show for like a thousand five hundred. Take your, you know, take your bus, like do your show, put all the cool little circus stuff everywhere, have a little circus music going on with the florals and I can, with your brochures and your, um, your business cards and uh, I can guarantee you're going to get hits and you're going to get collectors mm -hmm. and then what happens is the the galleries will come back the next year looking for you they're like oh I sold those two paintings for twelve thousand dollars each can I find her again yeah yeah and you're like gonna be like wow you sold it for twelve thousand and I sold it to you for a thousand five hundred and you're just gonna have to you know become like the provider right you become like um there that you start to understand the wholesale distribution and the trade right so the, the galleries and you start getting co collectors and you start getting galleries that'll come to you let's say you have 40 galleries a year hmm. that want your work then what happens you know then you're having then you're having shows, then you're traveling, then you're doing it full time. Now you have to ask yourself if that's something that you want. Right. And, um, but I think every artist wants to 
you know, be successful. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just, Why wouldn't you? I think it's just, it just comes with the territory um, of being an artist. You're doing it for some reason. And, you know, whether we make money or not as artists, I truly believe that art uh, is important for society and it's not necessarily about capital, but that's what I would do if I was in your place with your style, which is phenomenal. It's cool, man. Like who doesn't want that? I want it. <laughs> Can I have a painting right now? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yes. Yes, you can. Yeah, so um, so tell me, you know, like if we if we do like some brainstorming with your work, uh, have you ever thought about the Circus de Soleil? No, no, I haven't really. But perhaps I could do something there. Um, maybe place an ad in their brochures that they give out at their shows. I don't know how that works exactly. Well, like some of the, like, uh, some of the trade shows that I've done, like, let's say there's horse shows, you know, so like the Kentucky Derby can, will have like a booth for like a thousand bucks. Nice. So there's circuses, there's different circuses that have booths where you can take your work, right? And right. then you study the style of their brand and then you present your work under that brand, right? Um, you don't wanna take the brand, but you just kind of are under the umbrella of that brand. Does that make sense? Would that then affect my paintings that I present to them? So, you know, I don't know what the, what the situation with Circus de Soleil is, but I know that they're like, like the Kentucky Derby, what I did with my horses is I went to the, I, I got a booth at their show. And, um, you know, and then I was inspired by the different horses and different looks. And then I created my horses to go around that, like, or like the Arabian horse show. Um, so I know that there's a bunch of stuff on a global, this is great, the two girls right there. Thanks. The twins. I know that there's stuff, that's great with the mask, that there's surfaces and trade shows that you could do and boots, but you can also do, uh, you can also do booths um, at like normal shows where, where it's not, it doesn't have a gimmick, right? So you could do stuff at Circus de Soleil, I think, or other circuses, and you could launch yourself as a brand artist. And I know a lot about branding uh, because I've had to do it for 20 years, you know, and kind of get to that place where you're, having to reinvent yourself, but at the same time, having to stick to the look, which is not easy. <laughs> you know, you're like, you have to reinvent yourself, but you have to stay in, in the box. It's very, very, very hard. Wow. So what you can do is play around with the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And the circus has like endless subject matter, right? I mean. Sure. Sure. So tell me about the paintings that, that are behind you. Um, this one is sort of, uh, it has, you were just showing a photo of it. The one with the two girls on the tail. Yeah. Of, yeah the twins playing violins. Yeah. Tell me about um, the mask. Oh, I love the, the bird mask. It, the bird mask. It has a history that's a little bit creepy, actually. Doctors would wear it. Um, during the Black Plague, when they would go in to treat patients, they felt like it would protect them from getting it because it covers their nose and their mouth a little bit. Well, they were a little bit right. 
they're a little bit creepy, but I love, I love that look. And they were used, you know, in, in uh, Commedia dell'arte. Dell so you know, it's like they were wearing it to like scare away the, uh, the I, spirits, maybe. Maybe, so, maybe that was more it than anything else. But, but yeah, it's also in, it has a history in, in Commedia dell'arte and, you know, ancient Shakespeare stuff. You see it. it I just love it. I love that mask. It has the mysterious, a little bit creepy, but also beautiful at the same time, depending well, on yeah, the Yeah, it's very, like, it's very uh, intriguing. Your work is very intriguing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I like the uh, frame that you have on it, this gold kind of Renaissance frame on it. That's cool. Yeah, I tend to lean towards that when I'm framing my work. Yeah, so you're ready to go, man. You are like, <laughs> I can't, I mean, I don't know exactly how to, you know, I can't say, oh, uh, this is what you should do. It's all dependent on the artists, but your style is ready to be taken to the next level, I think. Thank you. You know, and that's this is a great photo is that you that is me and i have a easel behind me that was um like where i would do the live paintings so you're painting while you're doing trapeze yes oh my um, god i mean i'm sitting and that's it's actually called the lira um i default the painting i don't see the painting that's right behind me. There's a board sitting at an angle and it's strapped to the pipe of this trapeze rig. And I can't see it well enough to see, there must be a painting there. But I had, a, I had an interview by a news anchor woman, Monique Griego, Channel 10, I think it was. And they came to my house and they, they did an interview and it was on the prime time news. And I looked like a crazy person, <laughs> but it was really lovely. She did a really nice piece. And this is a shot from that night. I think maybe not, maybe it's just the easel there, but yeah, it's hard to see that it's an easel, but I, I know it is. <laughs> yeah. That's a great way to market your work. Oh, the next one, the next video was Monique Griego. That's the, world map on the ostrich egg for the David Wright house. He did an interview with me as well. So what is it again? This is the uh, world map on the ostrich egg. Next to this one was the video with Monique Griego doing the, the aerial paintings. Yeah, there it is. Athletic art, that's what they called it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, see, my pigment is there, and I'm bringing it up to the canvas. <laughs> There's a tint that I was talking about in one of my paintings. That's down in Tucson with Flem Chen. That's a circus floor. Moments back to life. This is just out of my memory of watching the vlog. 
and inside work at an artist name surrounded by his students. Wonderful to share that sort of exhilaration and that empowerment in the human flag. Both of them may feel 12 feet. That is so cool. <laughs> That's sweet. Yeah. Yeah, that is great. Um, so that's something for sure that you can market yourself in. You, you can also uh, keep posting that and keep uh, boosting that video. You can boost it and then make it go viral. You know? um, and you could do live shows so you can incorporate your art your painting with the live shows, right? So it's amazing what you're doing. It's, it's I mean, who doesn't want to like hang out with you and like, you know, <laughs> like you're you're like a, a circus, like a uh, prodigy. Hmm. You know, you're doing like prodigy kind of stuff, right? Um, so what's keeping you from like going to the next level for you? Who's keeping me from doing that? I guess I, I always feel like I need a lot of projects going on around me. And so the escape, the escape room really took me away from focusing on my art, but at the same time, it was inspired from my art. Right. So it's a catch 22 as so much of life is. It's so funny how often that happens where, you know, you're focusing on your art and then something pulls your focus away from that. And it's connected, but it's yeah. away from so, it. So you're being distracted. You're but it is, I, do, I did feel like it was kind of an anchor for me. Like um, it could, help with the income that can support me in doing my art right as there's there's patrons here in the escape room i could be working on a painting right so it's a side business correct uh so and it's fun right it's helping you connect and network and meet people and right and then show your work but then you're you're doing the escape room for um for fun, inspiration, and also business. And you would like to have your artwork as a main, or as a running business, right? Right. Um, ultimately, I think as artists, we have to come to a decision. And that's something that I had to come to. And um, other artists I know, they, they either, you know, th there's a point where you go, oh my gosh, I could just, do this all the time like that just becomes my livelihood hmm. and that kind of uh thinking is a decision it's just a decision right um because you know once you start with the shows and once you start with your galleries and once you start with your style and once you commit hmm. then it goes to the next level, right? So there's some people that are afraid of success. Some people are afraid of failure. Some people are afraid of both, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I've had to kind of, for me, I've had to go, like I've had to get rid of both fear of failure and fear of success right. and just be neutral. Um, and then trusting you know, the universe and then being living in that inspired space. But anyways, I think what it is for me is um, commitment. Commitment, baby. Right, right. You know, and uh, being committed to yourself as an artist is one of the most empowering things on the planet. And being distracted is one of the dis most disempowering things on the planet. Right. Right? And we all go through it. Um, 
so that's why I ask you, you know, what is it that's, that's keeping you from going to the next level as an artist? Um, because then it's just a hobby, right? Yeah. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do, it's fine. But I think that there's something that you have that is, that you can take it to that next level. I think I've always been a little bit of a, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit of a rebel. I don't like to buy into mainstream. And there's a, like a little bit of that young rebel that still lingers in me. And I guess part of that is sort of being the underground. Like I have my own art gallery in the Airstream, but I know I need to get over that. I know I need to get into these art shows that you're talking about festival well, you, you know you don't have to do that that's just something that um i know what you're talking about it, but that has to do a little bit with the fear of success you sure. see? yes i do yeah so, like that. yeah that's so awesome. you know when i started doing my posters and doing all these different things shows um i had a lot of people going oh you're such a sellout <laughs> like, <laughs> people are so horrible and my my publisher would be like just ignore them you know whatever but I was so sensitive because I was losing you know like my lower like my root home friends and I wasn't fitting in with like the higher echelon of artists and I was like limbo right um and it is it is something that you learn how to navigate um, by just staying true to yourself, you know, like the natural humans naturally want to proceed and, and grow, you know, um, and that doesn't mean that you have to lose your underground, um, like your soul, basically, right. your soul. You don't have to lose your soul. Like this painting right here, or this photograph, could be such a cool painting. Like this. That's Flem Chen again. Yeah, like Flem Chen's so amazing. They truly are. They came up for the parade in Phoenix, the Papa Parade. I just moved back from Spain and I participated with my skeleton puppet. Yeah, it's so cool. So this would be a great painting. So one of the ways that I started to do it is I started to incorporate my soul into the branding. You know, like I'm from Mexico. I grew up around horses, mm. you know. So then you just continue. It's just a continuation of your soul. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Absolutely, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so then you don't lose your soul as you continue with the growing as an artist, whether it's super popular or not, you maintain um, integrity. And there's a lot of judgment as to when people start making it, they're like, oh, you sold out, blah, 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 uh, with the artists, but again, I think if you maintain your soul integrity, it really, you know, it's like, that's another great painting right there. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yeah. It's that's good. Good. It's it. They love it. That I salvaged. It's spooky. It's vintage. It's um, mysterious. It's, you know what? So, This is cool. Yeah, that's the storyboard again. Yeah, so giving it, giving people like um, limited editions and watercolors and sketches and. That was a hair show from Indigo Verton. We ran the Red Door Art Gallery together for a while. She's the one that got my back the painting. That what? She, she was the one that inspired me to paint again. And I had an art show there. We had a, her and I both had pieces for this art show. She, yeah, inspired me to start painting again. And she did a, she created that wig and she had a 
photography session with it and other wigs. <laughs> yeah, you're there. <laughs> you're great. I love it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, do you have any questions for me as far as um, branding and art styles and uh, you know anything that we didn't cover or anything you want to talk about uh, further? I guess just a little bit more about branding. I still am not wrapping my brain around how to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the circus and the sepia tone and the old world is my branding. Maybe that's. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things when I work with my, uh, when I work with artists is I just like kind of get a feel of their, what, what they love to do. Right. And then we go from what they love to do into like what makes money. Right. Cause you don't want to sit around and make money at something that you hate. Right. Mm -hmm. So you go with what you like and what you love, and then you move into how can I market? And it's a very easy step. And one of the things that I help artists do is, uh, you know, I help them, I help them with connections and I help them all these different things as we move on. But first, one of the first things I start to work with them on is their logo. And the logo kind of is the umbrella that you're gonna put your work under and um, there's a lot of debate on whether a uh, logo is important or not you know like google changes their logo like every day and they're like a logo is not important and then some people the reason why i stick with the logo is because um you know everybody under everybody remembers like a monet signature or a picasso signature or every everyone remembers like virgin Airlines signature so I was like, to me, sometimes humans just need that one look, that one symbol. And so that's why I did my logo. I did it um, with, the, with the Picasso inspiration and the Monet inspiration. And I painted and like, I did like 150 paintings of my sculpture, of my uh, logo. And then wow. I like narrowed it down to 30 and then I narrowed it down to 10 and then I narrowed it down to like two and then narrowed it one. And then I just stuck with that one for like 20 years. So, um, and it's a good fun project to get started in our mentorship where you um, go, okay, what is my logo? It could be like that symbol that we were looking at with the flower. Um, it could be something else, you know, it could be a symbol. What do you want to be when people look at your work, at your logo, what do you want to be remembered as? Can it be my signature? Yeah, you can do your signature. Like I did my signature based on Picasso and Monet and, you know, I did it red. I wanted it to be flashy. I wanted it to be bright. I wanted it to be, um, you know, I'm a Leo. Like I wanted it to be expressive and I also wanted it to be painterly. So that's why all the little splatters, you know, so it's not just like a very clean cut logo. It has like, it has some messiness like me, <laughs> you know, like life, life is not perfect. Right. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to incorporate that, uh, that imperfection in my logo. Right. Uh, as a painter, but, the thing is there's so many different logos that people do like when prince changed his name to a low to a symbol hmm. so you could have a symbol so you know it's like anything you could decide to do anything really it's up to you so when you have a logo you still use your signature when you're signing your painting yeah my my logo is my signature as right. an artist. yeah it's like that's what the way it should be but i get that there's other options yeah there's there's many options there's just simple i can't imagine well like the symbols for my right. art logo is a a lion of judah okay a gold so for my books i just put the lion 
Okay. There's no words. You know? Yeah. Right. Um, so that's something that I think we can work on together. And then you can like come up with a couple of them and send them to me. And then um, narrow down what it is you're doing. And what happens when you do a logo, when you, when you launch everything under you, the umbrella of your logo, man, I'll tell you, some pretty magical things happen. Because huh. you become, um, you've made like a commitment into the st in stepping into you. Yeah. You know, into your substance, into your soul, into your umbrella, under, the, under your brand. And then you learn how to protect it and grow it, right? Hmm. And so it starts with a little house, a little logo house. Yeah, there aren't symbols that have like ancient powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They draw power, yeah. right? Yeah. I remember touching on that somewhere, reading it. Somewhere. Yeah, symbols have a lot of power. Uh, names have power. Um, something that you're working on in your um, mind, and you could study it. Like if you see a Coca-Cola logo, is there any I doubt in your mind that they're selling anything in, but Coca-Cola? They're selling Coca-Cola, right? Right. Pepsi, they're Pepsi done, right? So, you know, when you do um, your logo, you want to create that, like, I know what I'm looking at, you know? So like, even it could be like the moon with the woman, you know? Yeah. Nice. So you could stylize that as a logo. Whatever it is that you want to do. You could do both. You could do a name and you could do a logo. I mean, a, a symbol. Okay, sure. And I could combine them. Yeah, use them together or, and separate, but... but nice. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So that's a fun way to start uh, because then you can start, I don't know what it does. It just creates a little house, <laughs> a little safe place. It's, it creates a little safe place for, your, for, for you to launch your, your, um, your soul work without it being um, like crushed, you know, or it, it's like a type of protection, I guess. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I think that's good. Do you, th do you have any other questions? No. This has been wonderful. It's been a wonderful experience. Yeah. I think you got such a great look to you, um, and to your, and to, and the things that you're doing with the circus and the trapeze, the live trapeze is like phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You could get that on the news every time. Mm -hmm. And then with the launch of your brand, with the launch of your um, like larger paintings, uh, you can also market that. And, uh, and then you just do it in a way that it's fun and protecting yourself, you know? And you have a right to go to the next level as an artist. And that's another, another thing that I think you know, comes down to that, like, stay neutral, right? You, you stay in the place where you're not afraid of success or, or not afraid of failure. Right. You're just like, this is mine. Claim it. Right. <laughs> like, I'm taking this. This is mine. I got this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it is yours. Nobody else is doing what you're doing. Right. Cleaning on trapezes and, like, doing this cool sepia decor kind of like mystery stuff i mean you got it it's yours so brand it yeah you no know, claim it people take it you like this is mine nice and that empowers you you know fantastic yeah so let's let's brainstorm on that and um and then we'll we'll chat soon okay and uh where can people find your work on, a, on, just a... on Facebook, Maddie Baines, Maddie Baines Art.
Yeah, you can see it at the top there. Okay, Maddie Bain's art right there. Correct. And, uh, and then you're working on your logo and you're working on a website and the style okay. and everything going on to the next level. Okay. And, but right now you can find you on Maddie Bain's art. Yeah. Okay, Basically. cool. Yeah. Great. It was nice hanging out with you and chatting with you. It's a bit chilly, so I've got the fire on. Yeah, it is chilly. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's connect in a few, um, weeks and we'll see how your logo is going wonderful okay that, send me some send me anything you have um, okay. will do okay mm -hmm. kisses martha all so, right honey thank you bye bye-bye <laughs>